This episode is brought to you by Namely. If you listen to this show, you know that one of the things that I talk about quite a bit is how do you keep ahead of business trends? It feels like the world keeps changing and I think we can all agree that keeping ahead can be its own full-time job. With everyone wearing multiple hats, it's easy to fall behind, but that is why you need to make the switch to Namely, the all-in-one HR solution that adapts with your business needs. Namely helps you and your team with all aspects of HR, from onboarding and performance management to payroll and intuitive benefits enrollment, whether you have 50 or 1,000 employees, all in one connected and modern platform. Plus, Namely is customizable for your company, culture, and goals, so they can match where you are now and adapt as you grow. Grow with Namely. Learn more about making the switch today by going to my special exclusive URL at namely.com forward slash F-O-W and make sure that the F-O-W is all lowercase. And if you go to that URL for a limited time, you are going to get one month for free when you switch to Namely. Don't wait, that's namely.com forward slash F-O-W and again, make sure the F-O-W is all lowercase. Well, my philosophy on no in general is that it's just feedback. That's all it is. And so we want to take that information, take that feedback, use it, roll it up to show up better for the next conversation, the next moment, the next situation, just a little bit better. So, you know, I I think you've always got to find the good in these moments. So no, at the end of the day is just feedback. We got to learn from it. We got to understand what we could have done differently or better. And, And then we got to move on. I I never, though, would outright ask an athlete for the business without having a strong relationship with them in the first place. So so there was no, no, I'm not doing that because the relationship was so good. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Leading the Future of Work. My guest today is Molly Fletcher. She is the author of four books one of the world's only female sports sports agents known as the female Jerry Maguire, and she has negotiated over $500 million in contracts. Molly, thank you for joining me. Absolutely. Treat to be with you. Yeah. As I was mentioning, I I stole you from David Novak's podcast because I was listening to, and people who listen to the show know David was a guest as well. And I heard your interview with him and I learned a lot from it. I thought it was a great interview. And I thought, well, we got to get Molly on here as well. So I'm uh, so glad that you agreed to be a guest. You bet. No, it's a treat. I'm a, I'm a big fan of David's too. Good man. Yeah, yeah, he is. Uh, why don't we start with a little bit of background information about you. Um, take us back to baby Molly, how you were raised, where you grew up. How did you become a sports agent? And for people not familiar, what does a sports agent actually do? Sure. Well, uh, you know, I grew up in Michigan with two incredible parents, um, you know, older brothers who were five years older than me, identical twin brothers who treated me a whole lot more like a a little brother than a little sister. Um, total tomboy and had just a really, really special upbringing, really incredible family. And for that, I'm very, very grateful because they continue to shape my decisions and values and, and, um, have been, and continue to be an an enormous part of my days. Literally, we talk several times a day and then played tennis at Michigan state. After graduating, I said, look, I want to be in the sports business. I moved down to Atlanta Hmm. to try to find a job in sports and sort of did some odds and ends job, odds and end jobs along the way. And, you know, negotiated a gig to free to teach tennis at an apartment complex in exchange for my rent which gave me a little bit more wiggle room because you don't make any money in sports out of the gates. And so, you know, I found my way then into a small agency in Atlanta. We had a few clients and I was Lenny Wilkins' driver during the Olympics. I would drive Lenny to all of his appearances. He was the head coach of the dream team. And so I would drive Lenny around. And when the Olympics ended, I remember thinking, how are we going to grow? What's our growth plan to get more clients, more coaches, more baseball players, more athletes? And, you know, the the agency, the president was pretty confident. He said, all referrals. You know, we we got our clients through referrals. That's how we've grown. It's worked great. And and I suggested we get more aggressive. (laughs) Let's go recruit these guys. 
And thankfully, he blessed a business plan, and, and I was off to the races recruiting baseball players and, and continuing to grow about 15, 16 years later to about 300 athletes and a team of agents helping us serve each of them. To your other question, Jacob, what are those days like? I mean, every day is different. I mean, you can imagine with NBA coaches, college coaches, broadcasters, golfers, I mean, you got guys and gals every day waking up, you know, getting injured, healthy, released, fired, traded, called up, called down, missing cuts, making cuts. So it is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a 24 seven deal. That's very fluid, but it's also most importantly about maximizing a remarkably unique window of time in an athlete or a coach life, coach's life. And I took that really seriously. So what does a sports agent actually do? So um, you manage all aspects of an athlete as far as telling them, and I mean, does it include managing personal finances, helping them figure out what team they should be a part of? Like what, what's included in your role? Yeah, for sure. Well, I mean, it, you know, it depends a smidge on the sport, but I would say, you know, let's take baseball as an example. And, and at the highest level, I would start by saying that, you know, there's three main ways that people help athletes. I mean, one is marketing, you know, which includes all kinds of things, of course. You know, obviously their primary contract or their contracts mm -hmm. and then their finances. And, you know, we always did two of those three. We did the contracts and the marketing and not the finances. And, and I always encouraged athletes, you know, have have an external resource doing that, have the checks and balances, have some people holding each other accountable there. So, um, you know, what does it entail? I mean, negotiating their contracts is obviously uh, doing that with their team, with their network, with their university, with their equipment sponsors, if it's a golfer, and, you know, anticipating those opportunities and then maximizing those opportunities for these guys. I mean, these are unique times for them to make an enormous amount of money in a short window of time and the yeah. clock is always ticking because they're physically ticking, right? Um, and then the marketing deals, right? If it's a golfer, you're doing their hat bag, ball shoe gloves, sleeves, you know, yoke, back of the neck bags, I mean, all of it. <laughs> and with, you know, other kinds of athletes or coaches, it's it's all their, you know, sort of off the field and even some of the endemic deals on the field. So their yeah. their deals, you know, with the endorsement companies for their cleats, their spikes, um, bats, batting gloves, all that kind of stuff. My uh, limited knowledge of sports agents comes from the show Ballers. Did, <laughs> did you see that show on HBO with The Rock? I I have. You know, I haven't watched every bit of it, of course, but yes, absolutely. And, and I've certainly had a lot of people reference it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, so you were part of this tiny agency and you helped it grow. Um, but I'm, I'm assuming that when you were going to these athletes, it was a tiny agency. Nobody knew you. Nobody knew the agency. Why would they sign with you? Like, what was your pitch? Like, you would go to an athlete and they'd say, who are you? Like, what agency? How did you get them to sign with you to grow the business? Well, one of the biggest and most important pieces of being, I think, successful in business in general and certainly in the agent space is relationships. Yeah. And I think it's time. It's consistency. So I was, for example, right when I started, I was down at Georgia Tech. I mean, I didn't start with A-Rod and Jeter, right? I needed to get, you know, these young guys coming out in the draft. So I was consistently down leaning on that fence with scouts and coaches and parents and building strong relationships. And I think pretty quickly, players and parents and scouts realized she's authentic. Mm. She really wants to help me maximize this window of time. She cares. She's consistent. She's going to be there for me. She has a, a company behind her to help support, um, you know, our needs as well. And so, um, but it, like every business, it's so relationship intensive and it's about being authentic. Yeah. And I think they knew like it wasn't, <clears throat> certainly wasn't about me being at the country club talking about the guys that I was working with, like maybe is, is some people's intent. It was about truly saying, okay, you're an 18 year old, you're a 20 year old who's worked for a period of time to get to this place. And, and we have to maximize that. And, and recognizing with every athlete and coach that you're gonna go through all kinds of things, good and bad. And I'm gonna be right there beside you through all of it. I had built a team as I continued to grow pretty quickly around me to make sure that we were supporting all aspect of an athlete's life. Mm. Um, and, and so 
you know, it depended on the, to answer your question, Jacob, it depended on the athlete or the coach. It depended on their world. But I'm a big proponent of getting in the head and the heart of the people that you're selling to, that yeah. you're calling on, that you want to connect with, understanding their gaps, solving for those gaps, and sometimes solving for them before they see them themselves. I always have this saying I used to say to my agents, act like you have the business before you have the business. Right. Like, in other words, behave in a way that sends a message to the people that you want to work with that this relationship really matters to me. In, in fact, it matters so much. I'm going to give you a little taste for what this might look like. Hmm. So th th those were important behaviors, certainly. Uh, can you uh, for people listening, uh, who are some of the athletes that you represented that people might be familiar with? Yeah. So baseball wise, I mean, guys like John Smoltz, Mark DeRosa. Uh, Wes Helms, Brian Moeller. We had a lot of, of baseball guys and gals. Um, you know, broadcast-wise, Ernie Johnson, Chip Carey. You know, NBA coaching-wise, Doc Rivers, Billy Donovan, um, Nate McMillan. Um, you know, college coaching-wise, Billy went to the college level. Mm -hmm. Izzo, golfers, Matt Kuchar. So, you know, we had a stable of great, great talent. Yeah. But most importantly, I would say... Truthfully, they were good people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that was a big deal because it's a 24-7 deal and you got to you gotta like them because they're calling you at, at night. They're calling you on the weekends. I wanted to look down at that phone and, and like the people that were calling me. So er earlier on, you say you were sp spending time at the dugout, leaning up against the fence. I mean, what, what were you saying? So, you know, the first time you went down there, you go down to the dugout, you see uh, athletes practicing, you see their parents there. What, what was your like... Your line? Would you just go up to them and say, "Hey, your your son's got a pretty good arm there," or like, how did you get into building that relationship? Yeah, I mean, I always like to know something that they would be surprised that I knew. I always like to have a piece of information or a nugget or a thought that would blow them away that I even knew. So maybe it was that I knew from the Boston Red Sox cross checker that he was number two on the board. Mm -hmm. Maybe I knew that. Um, you know, that he had just started throwing a slider and uh, he was getting a hold of it and locating it really well. Um, you know, it was knowing something that would surprise him that I knew that made sure they knew, obviously, as a female that didn't play in the big leagues, I had to overcome that too. And sometimes it was about demonstrating to them that I understood their world in the business. Um, it, you know, it was understanding potentially where the player was slotted and what that looked like from a draft perspective of where that meant he might settle in at, that he could be, you know, drafted by the Astros and, and here's who we know and here's what I'm thinking could happen and where his slot could drop him from a comp perspective and, and how we wanted to handle the conversations with scouts. Yeah. And, and so it was, you know, it was truly... It wasn't, candidly, Jacob, it wasn't about selling. Yeah. It was about adding value. You know, it wasn't about, it wasn't about trying to close the deal. It was about trying to demonstrate to them that I knew what they were worried about. I knew the market and I could make their world better. Hmm. And I think if you do that every day and do it consistently, after a period of time, they go, you know what? All these other people, they're just pitching me all the time. And, 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 and she's actually making my world better. She's adding value. She's giving me information and she's not necessarily asking for the business right away. You know, I believe you got to give, 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 and then, you know, maybe, maybe you ask. Yeah, no, I know. I like that approach. And it's probably very, very relevant for leaders out there too, uh, who it seems like one of the lessons is get to know your people, you know, don't, don't just focus on who they are as a worker, but focus on who they are as a human being, what they care about, what they value. I think it's an important lesson. Um, so for you, from that kind of sports agent perspective, you, you know, you're at the dugout, I mean, you're talking to parents, you're talking to coaches, you're talking to the athletes themselves. How long does it take to build that relationship or how long did it take you? Like you show up day after day, they recognize your face. Then it's like, Oh, Hey Molly, like good to see you again. How long did it take for you to finally make the pitch and say, Hey, by the way, I'd yeah. love to represent you. Yeah, and you always got to make the ask, right? I mean, and I think there's lots of questions you can ask along the way that are asking without asking that get you the kind of information that you need to understand if you're chasing the right business. Oh, how, how do right? you do if that? If they say, oh, no, my dad was a big league guy. I'm using his guy, right? Now you know you got no shot, right? Yeah. So, um, you know, <clears throat> if it was a guy that was coming out in the draft, 
I mean, it, you could you could start a year, two years before uh, wow. draft day. If it was a big league guy, the bigger the name, the longer it took, right? The bigger the guy, the closer he was to free agency, the closer he was to arbitration, the longer it took. PGA Tour player, the bigger the name, the more established, the longer it took. I mean, it's like business itself, right? The bigger the deal, the longer it takes. Wow. The bigger the athlete, the bigger the coach, the longer it takes. So it's a long sales cycle, no question. You said uh, you developed an act for asking without asking. So instead of just you know saying, hey, I want to represent. So how did you, what was your technique for asking without asking to get the information you needed to determine if you should make the ask? Yeah, so like, for example, I had a guy that I went after um, for a long time. And, and I remember that it was actually a mistake that I made where I didn't, I didn't ask early enough. And, and, and so the example of what you would ask if it's a guy that you're trying to get to switch is, what do you love about the agent that you're with? That gives you an opportunity to open the conversation with, they might say to you, well, actually, I don't. He, mm -hmm. he, he doesn't call me back. He never comes to see me play. I'm not really sure he's the right guy. Now you know you got an opportunity. If he says, it's my brother, I love him. Now you know you got no shot. Yeah. So I think in all of our businesses, we've got to identify what are the safe questions that we can ask that give us, get us into their world, help us understand them better, and then build enough of a build value in their life in a significant way over a period of time. That then when we go to ask for the business, yes is easy. Yeah. Right. I, I recruited Matt Kuchar for for years and or for for a period. It wasn't actually years, but it was for a period of time. And I poured into him, added a lot of value for he and his wife and you know, all kinds of different things. So that when I asked for the business, when it felt like it was the right time, it was a pretty easy yes for him. And I think that's how we want those conversations to go. The foundation's been laid and it's strong. It's crazy that you said it could take a year, months, more than a year, two years, three years. So this is a, you know, a lot of people complain about not getting a deal after like a couple of days or a week. I mean, you're out here <laughs> spending a year to who knows how long trying to get these deals. Uh, so it's, yep. it's, it's crazy, uh, the amount of work that, that's required. Um, have you ever been turned, I'm, I'm, I already know the answer to this, obviously you've been turned down where you've made the asks and people have told you no. Can you share a story about how, how does that work? Like you go and you ask for the, the sale, hey, I'd love, we'd love to represent you. And what did they just say? No, sorry, we're good. And what do you do after you get told no? Well, my philosophy on no in general is that it's just feedback. That's all it is. And so we want to take that information, take that feedback, use it, roll it up to show up better for the next conversation, the next moment, the next situation, just a little bit better. So, you know, I, I think you've always got to find the good in these moments. I mean, if I got to know, I know there's 750 big league guys. There's hundreds of college coaches. There's 125 guys out on tour that are making an interesting living. There's however many ladies on LPG, right? I mean, so no, at the end of the day is just feedback. We got to learn from it. We got to understand what we could have done differently or better. And, and then we got to move on. I, I never though would outright ask an athlete for the business without having a strong relationship with them in the first place. Okay. So, so there was no, no, I'm not doing that because the relationship was so good if anything, it was over a, a, a great dinner and a couple bottles of wine, and I love you, but I can't leave my guy, yeah. right? <laughs> but it wasn't like, uh, you know, the, the way a dude might get rejected from a pretty girl at a bar. Okay. So it wasn't, <laughs> okay, so it wasn't as vulnerable or exposing for you. Uh, no. Okay. Got it. No. And then what did you... No. Now, now, you could be recruiting somebody early on, and they could not pay attention to you when you're at the field or the court or the course. And you just have to pick up on those moments and recognize that there's a huge blue ocean of opportunity out there that, yeah. that, that you want to go after. And when you're told no, does the relationship end or do you keep the relationship? Have you ever had somebody tell you no that then later became a yes? Absolutely. That's a great question, Jacob. Yes. I mean, I, I, I had a golfer once that I went after... And I recruited him pretty hard. He was a stud for about a good solid year. And then he went a different direction. And, and I stayed in touch with him. Unfortunately, his dad died. I loved this guy. And his dad died. And I sent him a note. And 
you know, his mom had really great art and I went to her art show and bought a piece of art because I, I truly and authentically really liked Nick, this player. And so long story short, though, he signed with an agency and then after a year, it just wasn't right. And I'll never forget, I was standing um, in Puerto Rico, actually, my phone rang and it was Nick. And I was like, hey, man, what's up? And he said, I've made a mistake. I said, what do you mean? He said, I shouldn't be with these guys. Would you consider representing me? Wow. And I said, of course, I would love to. And, you know, we, we, we move forward that way. And so I believe that if you were going after someone and you do care about them and you do want to make their world better, I'm not sure that can come to a screeching halt yeah. if you're being authentic about it. Yeah. So, yeah. no, unless, uh, no, I, I always try to stay in their world to, to understand what was working, to support them in ways that they might need at times throughout their career. And sometimes that came back around and I was able to support them in a more professional role. When you think about um, leadership and business and work, what are some of the lessons that you think can be applied for leaders uh, as far as building relationships, as far as knowing how to make the ask, negotiating? I know you give a lot of talks for organizations how do you bring in what you've learned from being a sports agent into that business world? Yeah. Well, so much. I mean, I think, you know, for 20 years, it was truly a front row seat to peak performance. I mean, it was a front row seat to the way the best behave, prepare, recover, navigate change, adversity. It was a front row seat to it every day, all day long. And one of the things that I saw cons so, consistent so consistently is there is no room for complacency in sports. Yeah. Because there's always somebody right behind you that's dying to take your job, and he can see your stats. You know, in the business world, everybody's not necessarily, I mean, you're seeing some of the stats, but you're not seeing everything, right? In, in, in sports, you're seeing, you're seeing it all. They can see your salary, So they know how everything. well they're doing. Yeah, you're, well, you're seeing, you can see their shooting percentage. You can see their fielding percentage. You can see everything. Yeah. So, you know, there. I actually just launched a course called Up Your Game, and we identified what are the eight critical components to really up-level your game in life. And, you know, to me, there are things like limitless mindset, curiosity, purpose, discipline, resilience, confidence, energy, Right. And then certainly relationships, connection. And so we go deep in my course on all eight of those. But those, you know, mindset and, and, and a lot of keynotes that I'm giving now, that is a big gap, challenge, if you will, for people right now. Because um, m mindset's huge in our ability to perform at our best. Yeah, and I, I like... Uh... You know, the difference, like you said, in the sports world, everybody can see your stats, but in the business world, nobody can see your stats. So it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's different. And it, yeah, you probably see people in the sports world who are no room for complacency, constantly working, but I think you don't see as much of that in the business world. There is a lot of complacency. There is a lot of like, I'm good. We're just going to do things the way they always were because you don't feel like anybody's coming for you the same way that they yeah. do in sports. Um, right. Which That's is right. It creates a very interesting environment. No question. I mean, no, you're right. And and I think in business, you can see some stats, right? If it's yeah. a publicly held comp company at the highest level, if it's a, you know, maybe a sales team and they have kind of a leaderboard type deal, you can still see some, but it's not at the magnitude of sports. Yeah. And so it, it it is a, it is a constant driver to know. And, and what I also found, Jacob, that I think is important, particularly for business people is to understand that what I found with the best, the LeBrons, the Serenas, the, you know, Kobe's, it's not the drive actually to achieve things, right? Mm. And I talked about this in my recent TED talk. It's not the drive to achieve things, trophies, Super Bowl ring. It's the drive to get better. They yeah. aren't motivated candidly by the rings. Tom Brady has plenty. He's motivated by the desire to get better every play, every game, every season. And that's a mindset shift that I think can be powerful for business people too, is to, to have this belief. I had Gino Ariyama on my podcast, of course, head women's coach at Connecticut or at UConn. And, and I mean, Gino's been to 22 final fours. He's been to 14 consecutive final fours. He's won 11 national championships. Like, dude, that's insane. Yeah. 
And so I said to Gino, how have you done it? And he was like, oh, I just, I'm always curious about how I can get better. And, you know, that's a powerful mindset that I think we can all take into our own lives. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. This episode is brought to you by Namely. We all do our best to keep ahead of business trends. And if you listen to the show, you know that that's something that I talk about quite a bit. How do you stay up to date and how do you stay ahead in a world that seems to keep changing? And I think we can all agree that keeping ahead can be its own full-time job, but that is why you need to make the switch to Namely, the all-in-one HR solution that adapts with your business. Namely offers onboarding and performance management to payroll and intuitive benefits enrollment, all in one connected and modern platform. Plus, Namely is customizable for your company, culture, and goals so they can match where you are now and adapt as you grow. Grow with Namely. Learn more about making the switch today by going to my special exclusive URL at namely.com forward slash F-O-W and make sure that the F-O-W is all lowercase. And if you go to that URL for a limited time, you are going to get one month for free when you switch to Namely. Don't wait, that's namely.com forward slash F-O-W. And again, make sure the F-O-W is all lowercase. Um, you mentioned one of the people that you worked with was uh, Doc Rivers. Obviously, a lot of people know, head coach of the 76ers. Um, so I'm curious, to get somebody like that, right? Very known, I'm sure tons of people are going for Doc, right? Some of the world's biggest agencies, everybody's trying to recruit him. What what did you say to him or what did you do for him to end up working with you? Like, how did you build that better relationship? Because I'm assuming sports agents, they all know the name of the game is to build relationships. And so you're trying to build a relationship, but so is everybody else. What did you do differently for him to want to work with you and your team? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think one of the things that's important when you're recruiting these guys is to break it down into the stages of their career at some level, depending on where they are in their journey. And to help them understand as I progressed in my career that there's nothing you're going to go through that we haven't navigated for another coach mm. before. And, 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 you know, I remember recruiting Tom Izzo as an example. And Izzo was a guy that, you know, ha- had won a national championship at Michigan State. And, and I sort of did this, you know, act like you have the business before you have the business. You know, add value to his life, bring in endorsement deals, bring him appearances, uh, bring him speaking engagements to when all of a sudden they wake up and go, you don't even represent me and you're doing all this for me. And the guy that does isn't, can we have a meeting? Yeah. Can we talk about what else you do? And is this how you work? So you, right? you did all that stuff for free before you were even getting paid? Yes. I mean, I did that stuff. I had to do that stuff all the time wow. because if, I mean, think about our own lives. If somebody continues to add value to your life, you start to pay attention to them. Yeah. And when you're bringing coaches 10, 15, 20, 50, $100,000, and you can do that as an agent without, without representing them, they start to go, wait, she just brought me a $20,000 speaking engagement, a $50,000 endorsement deal. This is kind of interesting. Yeah. I think I might look at these guys to help me do what I do. So that's why I, and, and look, I mean, this isn't applicable in every business, right? You can't start managing money for a client if you're a wealth manager before you have them. But what I would say is there are things that we can do when we're trying to get business. Yeah. And, and part of it is getting creative. I think one of the most important things that's often overlooked from a sales perspective is creativity, right? Being creative about finding the gaps in people's lives so that you can add value. I'll give you an example. I had, there was a, a, a year where there was five young guys that all came up in the Braves organization at the same time. Okay. And I convinced a local station in Atlanta to do an interview with these guys. And I asked Smoltz if he would host it. If John would, you know, John, you're trying to get some reps behind the booth, right? Which is what he's doing now. What if you interview all five of these rookie guys and we film it and we put it out as like a 30 minute special on a local station. So I get the station to come up. I get all five of these superstar rookies up to the office. Well, of course, what an um, unbelievable opportunity for me to, to get in their head and heart, understand their gaps 
add a little value maybe. So I'm standing there at the end of our time together, a couple guys, and one of the guys says to me something about Carrie Underwood coming to town and how he, his wife loved Carrie Underwood. We left the meeting, and a day later I called him and I said, hey, would you be um, up for backstage passes to see Carrie and meet her with your wife and two seats in the front row? Wow. And he was like, wow, what do you mean? Wow. Like, it, So now they know you listen, you care, you add value. So, But all that was was an candidly an opportunity for me to get all five of those guys in the room with a veteran guy that they respect the heck out of ask a lot of questions to identify the gaps in their lives and then begin to the minute they walked out of that office i had a list of things for every single player of the kinds of things that i could do Hmm. to make their world a little bit better yeah that's amazing it's uh but, you know, some people might be listening or watching to this and thinking, well, you know, there's a lot of like working for free there, right? There's a lot of like, give people speaking engagements before you're getting paid, help people get sponsorships before knowing you're going to um, get anything out of it. I'm sure there have been plenty of times where you've done all this for somebody and you didn't get anything in return, right? So sure. how does that make you feel and how do you keep going when you get somebody a sponsorship and they're like, great, Molly, thanks. See you later. Well, number one, I tried to go after the guys and the gals that I thought valued that, that I knew were good human beings that wouldn't take, 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 take unless they had a heart and a soul and, and probably understood that, that, that maybe there was a way to, to connect more deeply after that. Okay. So I think part of it is chasing the right business, knowing who you're dealing with. Are they the kind of people that you think you align with from a core values perspective, yeah. period? So that was where I would start. But, you know, I think that you, you also truly in your heart of hearts want to help them. I mean, you, you, you have to do it because you, you like them and you, I'll give you another example. I was working out at a gym around the corner from our office and I would go and one of these young guys, he was a, a young guy with the Braves and he was working out there too. And he was just a great guy. And I was doing a baseball camp for one of my other players. And I went up to him when we were working out and we were just kind of like goofing around and having fun. And, and I said, do you do a camp for kids? And he said, no, but I want to. And I said, well, look, would you want to jump into this camp that we're doing with one of our other guys? I said, you know, it'd be a great experience for you. You get a little taste for it. Well now, and he was like, wow, that'd be, I would love that. And so that was a light lift. I got him involved with a camp. He gave back to kids gave me an opportunity to communicate and build a relationship with him. And then at the end of the camp and kind of as the season approaches, he switched and he said, Hey, you know, would you do something like this just for me in the future? And, you know, I just like the way you communicate and the way you anticipate my life. And, you know, I want to switch. So, but that was from a place of authenticity of wanting to include him in something that I thought as a young local guy would be good for him to do, but also as a place, it was a, it was an easy and a light lift for me too. Hmm. Can you share a time when you did do a lot of that work and it didn't turn into anything? Yeah, Andrew Jones, right? So I recruited Andrew Jones, a center fielder for the Braves, for like almost two years. I wow. mean, planes to all-star games, uh, appearances, all that kind of stuff. So you invested a, a and, thousands of dollars into this, tens of thousands of dollars. Yes, 100%. Wow. And we were sitting at dinner and, and I said, man, hadn't this been fun? And it was kind of time to, he was approaching free agency and good guy. And he said, you know, Molly, I just, I can't, I can't switch. I just can't do it. I mean, the guy that I've had has been with me since I got off the boat from Curacao. I just can't do it. Which, which totally get fine. And, and the mistake was really on my part. I mean, I should have asked him, what do you love about the guy you're with at yeah. the very beginning? And he would have said, oh my God, he's like a dad, a brother. He was there when I got off the boat from Curacao. I could never leave him. I would have known he was good, hmm. right? So there, there was times I, I tried to um, anticipate those moments. And I think the more established I got, the more clarity I had earlier on, which, which was always helpful. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Well, I think for leaders, that also is a good lesson or even just employees, right? To, to invest in the relationships and you know, not every in- relationship you invest in, even in your personal life is going to turn into a good one. Uh, and like you said, every relationship is a learning moment and you need to learn 
um, which relationships are worth investing. So what, what did you look for? Because I think this is very relevant and something a lot of people struggle with. I struggle with this sometimes as well. What do you look for in the people where you kind of get that signal, this is a relationship worth investing in? And what are some of the red flags you look for when it's like, this is not, yeah. this person is a taker. I don't see a relationship yeah. here. Time to move on. Well, I, I think you could look at that question. You could think about that question in a bunch of different ways. I, I mean, I think it, it, from a business perspective, I wanted to look at the opportunity that existed. Was the guy or the gal young in their career? Did they have a lot of upside? Were they going to be out there for a while? Was there an opportunity um, to, to, to capitalize on that with them and for them? You know, I didn't want to go after a guy that was in, you know, the last year of a multi-year free agency contract and he was about to retire. That yeah. didn't make sense. So, so number one, it, it sort of depended on where they were in their career and being professional and prudent about, about that. Um, you know, and, and, and then I think it was, who are they? I, I wanted to always ask my other players, you know, about an athlete or a coach. I mean, I wanted to have guys in clubhouses where if I went into town, I could take them both to dinner. You know, guys out on the PGA Tour that, you know, if if we were if I was coming in on a Tuesday and we were going to walk a practice round, that I could walk with both of them and spend time with both of them. Or on the LPGA player that I could be with both of them. You know, I'd, I'd say the third bucket there would be expectations. If inside of some of these conversations I was hearing things that would lead me to believe that their expectations and the reality of what I felt like I could deliver weren't aligned, okay. I needed to run. Because the last thing I'd want to do is walk into a relationship where the expectations were unrealistic in my view and theirs were at a, at a certain level and, and I was going to under deliver. And now I was going to have somebody out in the market that felt like I hadn't delivered to them. So ensuring and, and any red flags that I might see where, where their expectations, the way they were potentially viewing themselves in the market and comparing themselves to others was different than what I felt like was a reality to hmm. deliver. And what about from a personal perspective? So business perspective, obviously you're looking for upside, you're looking for potential. What about from like that human perspective of I could work yeah. with this person. I want, like if it was Saturday and I got their phone call, I'd want to pick up. Yeah, for sure. And, and those are the only kind of people I, I hire, right? Are people <clears throat> that I, that I want to go have a beer with, right? That I want to have a glass of wine with, that I want to go on a walk with. I mean, and so personally for me, whether it's friends, whether it's people that I love and care for that work for me, um, whether it's vendors um, or whether it's people that my husband and I, you know, go to, go to dinner with, I, I, want, I want to be around people who are curious, who are relational, who are disciplined, who um, are, are confident, yeah. um, people who have great energy. You know, I wrote a book called The Energy Clock because to me, energy can solve quite a few problems. Yeah. I, I like people that are solution oriented, right? That don't tell you what they can't do, but tell you what they can. <laughs> people who are authentic and loving, you know, people who are kind and compassionate, um, you know, people who are real. I, I, you know, I'll tell you, I mean, when you speak, I speak about a hundred days a year and you can hear all kinds of stuff, you know, of... You, you got to put people around you that'll tell you the truth too, you know? So you want relationships that are, that are authentic and, 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 and where there's that safety with one another to share yeah. the truth. So those kinds of things are things that come up for me. Well, what if some people are thinking, you know what, Molly, I, I don't have tens of thousands of dollars to invest in a relationship. I'm, uh, you know, at a company, it's corporate. How do I invest in that relationship without getting somebody backstage passes to carry Underwood tickets and private flights to all-star games? <laughs> like, what do you do if you're not in that position where you can spend so much for the relationship? Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, I, I speak to a lot of, you know, pharmaceutical sales teams or things like that. And, you know, or, or financial, and there, there's a lot of things that you can't do. And that is unique. I mean, that business model of the agent model is like extreme on the perspective, right, of the, of the amount of recruitment that has to potentially, you know, occur. And there's a lot of things that you can't do. I mean, you can't buy at some level and, and, and give um, in, in, in the business world. 
I think that's the opportunity at the deepest level to get creative. You're on the phone with them and they tell you that they're so excited because they're planning their spring break with their children and they're going to Disney. Well, get in their world. Maybe, maybe you put a, put a little packet or send them articles or information on the top 10 restaurants there. Maybe you, you know, help connect them to a, a place that they can get you know, discounts or coupons or fast passes or whatever it might be. But listen deeply to the people that you're selling to yeah. or that you want to connect with. And then anticipate those moments in their lives and get creative about how you can add value. And sometimes it's just it's just information, yep. right? It's 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 things of that nature. But it all starts with curiosity, right? I, I, when I moved to Atlanta, Jacob, I didn't have any money. I had sixteen hundred bucks in my pocket. I was living on my friend's couch, and I had no job. And so I go to this. I find out that this apartment complex was going to need a tennis pro, but the manager of the property didn't know it yet. Long story short, I called my buddy at Wilson Sporting Goods and begged him to send me a box of Wilson stuff. I went to the pizza place across the street from the restaurant and asked if they deliver 15 or 20 free pizzas a month for me to take to the t tennis clinic. And then I'd written these tennis tips in Michigan for a little kind of magazine in Lansing. None of those things cost any money. And I delivered those to her one day after another. And then finally she said, this tennis pro we have, he's great, but he's leaving. He never did anything like this. This is fantastic pizza, tennis tips, Wilson stuff. She was like, can you be our tennis pro? And I lived at that property for free for nine years. None of those wow. things cost a penny. But it was about recognizing and getting in her head and heart and saying, what's she worried about? She's yeah. not really worried about a tennis pro. She's worried about keeping her occupancy up and keeping her residents happy. Yeah, I love that creative. Uh... So who paid for the pizzas? He, d I put a coupon from the restaurant in the newsletter that they oh. delivered to the front door of every apartment, and he agreed in exchange for me stuff in the coupons to give me fifteen pizzas for free. Oh every my month. god, I love it! Oh wow, you're a it hustler. was just a t gigantic trade out. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. Um, you know, one of the things that I think a lot of people are also scared uh, with is is getting turned down, and can you share a little bit about when you do get turned down? How do you mentally, like, how do you, and, and I'm thinking about this yeah. in a corporate setting, right? You ask for a promotion, you get turned down. You apply for a job, you get turned down. You try to build a relationship or a connection with somebody at work, you get turned down, it doesn't go well. And in that context, a lot of people really struggle. They get down on themselves, they beat themselves up, they think, well, I'm never going to go out on a limb again, or I'm never going to get promoted, or I'm never going to get a job. How do you mentally go through these periods where you get turned down to to get past them. And I'm sure you've seen this in, with athletes as well, right? They lose a game, they lose a sure. match. How do they approach defeat to get back in, try harder and win? Well, I mean, you're talking about resilience, right? And, and resilience is integral to winning in life and in, and in business. I mean, I think there's a couple things. One is why do you do what you do in the first place? Because if you have a clear <clears throat> sense of purpose around your work, around your mission in life, if you will, then you go to that place when you've got to get through the hurdles and the speed bumps. Yeah. You go to that. When I would watch athletes go to days of rehabs or early batting practice or stand on the putting green until the sun was down, it was because they knew one day they were going to maybe drain a putt and their wife and their children were going to run out. They knew that they were going to buy a house for their parents. They knew that they were going to finally reward that coach that's been beside them since they were 13. They, they had a bigger purpose and, and, and they would go to that. That to me is integral. I think that you also got to pull back and say, what's the story I'm telling myself? And is it serving me? Is it taking me where I want to go? Or should I tell myself a different story that in fact will take me where I need to go that aligns with in fact what I want most? Yeah. Now I'm not suggesting this is easy, but what I am suggesting is it's possible and it's important. You know, and so when, 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 when Dan Jansen was training for his last Olympics, he was telling himself, I hate the 1000 meter. 
I can't break the 36 second barrier in the 500 meter. That's my best race because nobody's done it, but I want to break a world record. He was telling himself a story that was limiting his performance, but it was a mindset problem really at the core with Dan. It wasn't a performance problem. Hmm. Long story short, he said and wrote and, and trained himself to say, I love the 1000 meter. He won a gold in the 1000 meter at the Olympics because for 11 straight months, every day, all day, he stared at this. And then he wrote 35.99, which was one millisecond faster than 36. He broke the 36 second barrier in the 500 meter four times before the Olympics, but he changed his story and it changed his performance. So when we go through hurdles and speed bumps and when we have challenges, we have to first say, what's the story I'm telling myself around that? And do I need to tell myself a different story that in fact takes me where I want to go? You know, Billy Horschel, he just won recently, but Billy was on my podcast and he was telling me that he played a practice round with Tiger Woods and guys love playing. I mean, what a treat, right? I mean, you're playing with one of the best in the world ever. Of course. He was playing a, playing a practice round with Tiger and, and he was telling Tiger how he prepares for his tournaments. He said, you know, I, I, you know, I hit every fairway. I'm at every green in regulation. I'm draining every pot. And I finish on Sunday with a trophy over my head and I won the tournament. And Tiger goes, dude, that's awesome. He said, but do me a favor. Visualize yourself in the rough. Visualize yourself having to drain a long putt to make the cut. Visualize yourself in a trap and you got to get up and down to make the cut. Visualize yourself in tough moments and then visualize yourself recovering. To me, that is such a big, you know, we always talk, we hear about visualization and, you know, visualizing greatness, if you will. And I think that's great. But we also have to visualize ourselves coming back. Yeah. Right? And recovering from the tough stuff too. Yeah. I love that. That's great advice. Yeah, the mindset, the internal story that we tell is important because it's easy to beat yourself up, uh, but it's much harder to, I think, lift yourself up when things aren't going well. Uh, I know we only have a couple of minutes sure. left, and I wanted to yeah. um, maybe spend the rest of our time talking about negotiation. So you negotiated over $500 million in contracts. Um, I had Chris Voss on the podcast a little while ago from, uh, you know, I'm sure you know Chris from negotiating as well. Uh, what were your techniques that you used to negotiate successful deals? Uh, because we're always negotiating in our lives, a higher salary for a job. Sure. What did you find was most effective? And, and do any stories come to mind where a certain amount was offered and how you were able to increase it and what you did to do it? Sure. Yeah, I mean, a ton. I, I think, you know, when and we teach negotiation because obviously it's a critical life skill. I'm not sure there's a leader in the world that isn't great yeah. at it or needs to be great at it. You know, I, I, number one practice for me was always getting and understanding the kind of person I was negotiating with. What it, are they financially focused? Are they relational? Are they strategic? Are they logistical? What are they worried about getting in their world? I think one of the biggest mistakes we make when we negotiate is we spend way too much time thinking about what we want and not enough time figuring out the things that drive the person that we're negotiating with. Yeah. I think we've got to add value to the people that we negotiate with. We got to make their world better. People have a lot of choices today around who they do business with. I think we've got to add value to those. You know, we have a preparation technique that we teach. Preparation is paramount. Right, because the more prepared you are, the more comfortable you are with the zig and the zag of the conversation. And negotiation is just a gigantic zigzag, no question about it. And so the more prepared, the more confident you are to navigate the, you know, the sort of the waves that come in and out throughout the conversation. You're more confident and comfortable pausing when you need to inside of these conversations. You know, tactically, some of the things that, you know, just kind of some quick nuggets for listeners is you know, shift from defensiveness to curiosity. It's easy in negotiations to get a little defensive. It's easy to want to put your fists up and, and go back at them. But what I always found as an agent was the more connected I was relationally to the people that I was negotiating with, the better the outcome. I believe strongly that when we lay a great foundation relationally, then we and we add value and we prepare deeply yeah. now we can ask for what we want with confidence you know one of the biggest 
according to the data, reason people don't negotiate as much as they could and maybe should is a lack of confidence. And the reason they don't have confidence is because primarily they don't practice enough. Mm -hmm. And so how do we practice negotiating all the time, everywhere, all day, every day? Because, you know, for me, for 20 years, I just, I did it all day long, every day. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you get doing it. Yeah. Right. So practice is huge. And it, I'm talking about practice with your yard guy, the window guy, practice with anybody, practice at Starbucks, getting an extra shot for free, just practice. Because the more you practice getting comfortable inside of these conversations, the better that, that you'll get. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, those are just a couple tactical things. Obviously th there's a whole lot to unpack there, but I would say relationships are the foundation. Practice is key to build the confidence and, you know, consistent practice in order to continue to see the opportunities that exist, which are plentiful. Does a particular story come to mind of when you were offered a certain amount and that you had to negotiate it for a higher amount? How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> or just one that comes All the to time. Mind. I mean... I can't remember a time that a general manager, a network executive came in and said, we want to pay him above market. Let's go. Yeah. It happened all the time. I mean, yeah, I was negotiating a guy. He was arbitration eligible. This is a story that comes up for me because it's kind of it's kind of interesting. And, and we had a great relationship with the team. We negotiated for four or five months and we just wow. could not come to terms. My player was really confident in what he wanted. So he was sort of ready to go to the mat. Okay. It was the night before arbitration. I had, I, I was, I had a great relationship with the general manager. We, you know, we add a, a lot of value. We prepared deeply. I knew the market. I knew what he was worried about. All these things, the foundation was strong. So we're getting ready to go to arbitration in Phoenix, because we hadn't come to terms, which means I'm going to have to put my baseball player in a room with three perfect strangers who are then going to decide what he's going to make, which I never liked doing. So I'm going to bed. My phone always used to be by my bed. I don't recommend that. And it's the night before we're leaving. And the general manager called me. This is five months into just daily grinds of conversations. And he called and he said, this is incredible. You're firm. I said, we are, we are. He goes, wow. And for about a minute and a half, nobody said anything. I mean, I just, I just sort of said, yes, we are, we're, we're firm. And it was quiet for a minute and a half, which is by the way, a little bit odd. Yeah, that, I was gonna say that, that's probably pretty awkward. <laughs> Super weird. Super weird. And, and then all of a sudden he goes, unbelievable, you got a deal. And we locked in and, and you know, but that was an example of how important it is tactically to pause inside of these conversations. Yeah. If you've laid the foundation and you've prepared and you all these things that we teach inside and go, if we've done all those things, then we can ask and pause. And when we do that, it sends a powerful message. Pausing is super powerful in yeah. negotiations. And a pause can be a minute and a half over the phone, <laughs> which is weird. Or it can be a week, a month, a couple days. I mean, but when we lean into that pause, it's powerful. I love it. Uh, Molly, I loved your stories so much. So many uh, uh, great insights and experiences. I feel like I could talk to you for another like two hours. Um, <laughs> where can people go to learn more about you? You mentioned you have a podcast, you have books. Let people know where everyone can go to uh, connect with you and, and get some more of your content. Sure. Yeah, you're sweet. MollyFletcher.com is uh, is our website, and and then our, my podcast is Game Changers with Molly Fletcher, and uh, but all that can be can be sourced sort through MollyFletcher.com. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, I think you had Bethany Frankel as a recent guest on there. I did. Yeah, you have some great great interviews in there. I'm a big fan. So I hope uh, everyone goes to check out the podcast, and I hope they uh, check out your website, and of course grab your books as well. Uh, Molly, thank you so much for taking time out of your day. Really appreciate it. Absolute pleasure, Jacob. Thanks for having me. Of course. And thanks everyone for tuning in again. My guest has been Molly Fletcher. I will see all of you next week. Thanks again for tuning in to today's episode. Please remember to rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or whatever your preferred channel is. I cannot express how important 
Those reviews and ratings are to the success of the show, and they keep allowing me to bring back amazing guests. Lastly, don't forget to check out the brand new PDF that I just put out, which looks at the evolution of the employee. In other words, how employees are evolving and changing and what you as an organization should do to adapt. You'll get a complete breakdown of what that evolution looks like, as well as action items that you can and should be taking. That PDF is available at thefutureemployee.com. And if you wanna reach out to me for whatever reason, whether it's inviting me to speak, sponsoring the show, or just giving me some feedback, you can always do so. My email is jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Again, that's jacob at thefutureorganization.com. Thanks again for tuning in and I will see you next time.